Okay. Hi, everyone. So today is our fifth recitation. And as usual, uh, I will be reviewing what we've covered last week, since it's important for what we're going to cover this week. So we've mentioned that uh, how operating system provides abstraction for the users and how the, it uh, enforces boundaries between the user space and kernel space. And that we've mentioned that the user space basically nothing else but the, priv or the normal mood and the kernel space is the privilege mood. We've also mentioned that the system call basically is to allow the user to or the user program to request services from the operating system, whether it's hardware or software related. We've also went through a system call step by step, uh, which is the time to call. And uh, from the time that the user make the syscall to the time that uh, he or she received the um, results. Please note that uh, here there is your OS 161 ships with a, a man pages or manual. So you can refer to that manual uh, for all the sys uh, syscalls that you need to implement. It tells you what arguments to uh, that, uh, that specific syscall that you're going to implement will expect and what should it return. What are the error codes that you need to uh, think about. So basically, it has everything that you need uh, to implement your system calls. We've also mentioned how the interruption handling process goes. And we mentioned that once an interrupt happens, the uh, kernel will basically switch, or the system will enter the privilege mode, or the pro processor will enter the privilege mode, and it will record the state. And then it will jump to a predefined uh, address, which is the OX 8 million. And this is where 80 million, and this is where the kernel uh, space starts. We've also mentioned that there is a convention between the user space and the kernel space that need uh, to be um, followed, which is if uh, the user wants to pass arguments through the system calls to the kernel, then he has or she has to, to place uh, these arguments in the first four registers. If the arguments are 32 bits from uh, A0, A1, A2, A3, but if it's uh, 64 bit, then it, they should be uh, placed aligned, which means it's either should be an A0, A1, or A1, A2. It, ha it can't be an A1, A2. Uh, also, f the same goes with the return values. So you're going to place a 32 bit value in V0 register and uh, the 64 value in V0, V1. And the A3 will just uh, hold a zero that indicates success. We've also mentioned that you have the copy in, copy out functionality that you need to use whenever there is a user pointer passed to the kernel space. Uh, and what it will do, it basically will try to detect any kind of violation uh, that these pointers have by checking the value that they point to. We've also summarized the system call lifecycle. Basically, what happens is the user will put the argument uh, into registers A0, A3, uh, and it will make a syscall through the instruction syscall. At that point, the hardware will step in and change the mood into the privilege mood, which is the kernel mood. It will save the context. The kernel now will identify what kind of interrupt has happened whether it is a system call, hardware interrupt, software interrupt, timer interrupt. And then it will see that it is a system call. Now what will happen is the system call dispatcher will come in and check what system call has been uh, requested by the user. And it will dispatch it and uh, execute it. Then it will put the return value or the result into the A0 and V0 registers. And then it returns uh, these values to the user and the user space. We've also mentioned uh, how you should add a system call. So the process goes like this. First of all, you need to go into the manual, man page for the, for the system call that you're trying to implement. See what kind of arguments that system call receives and what arguments it returns. 
by this you need to uh, figure out in which registers these arguments are saved and this is where in the syscall C file you have the switch statement now you, you need to call your f the function that you're gonna implement here and for the arguments as you can see here now uh, so, uh, since the time syscall receives the seconds and nanoseconds then uh, and they are 32-bit values so it knows that they are placed in register A0 and A1 so once you check the man pages you check the argument you add another branch into the switch statement uh, and call your function and pass these uh, registers that come from the trap frame that we uh, went through uh, last time and then you need to write your function into that file which is syscall.c and just put the signature of that uh, function into the header file this is the, the easy way so once you're done with one or two syscalls and you know how the procedure goes then you might want to do it the standard way which is basically what putting all the uh, file syscalls into one file and all the process syscalls into another file and you follow these uh, steps and you can it will go through and everything would, would just like uh, run fine so this is last time any questions okay so today we have a lot to cover we're gonna cover the file system support part today and the process support going to be next week so we're going to cover the process model file system support file table design file handle design argument checking and console file and then we're going to go through the uh, syscalls that you need to implement so it is recommended we always recommend to students that start with the file system calls because uh, these are easier to implement and uh, also that the process syscalls have uh, some dependencies uh, with the file syscalls so we always recommend that you start with the file system call so, and the deadline gonna be uh, one and a half week from today that was just like an exception this time this why because i think the testing wasn't ready or something that's why no nope. <laughs> uh, so please start i mean uh, it's pretty late now so everybody i think you've uh, you are familiar with this uh, figure which is it was in the uh, lecture slides so basically we have the process it tells you that process contains threads and address space and please note if you can see here that the address space since this is a user process starts from OX0 to OX80 million so that means from OX80 million and on then we're on, uh, into the we go into the kernel space so this is the address space and what we need to implement is the file table uh, and that's what we're gonna explain now so this is basically the process model and you might wonder okay all this process where does it reside so it is defined in pros, uh, or proc.h file so if we go here in the proc.h you can see the process structure defined here and here where you need to add stuff so or to complete that figure so as you can see we have a name we have an address space and that's it and that, then you need to add more materials here right? so you need to complete that figure which is the for example one of the things that you need to do is design the file table so let's understand how the file system support works here so we have three abstraction file descriptor file handle and file object a file descriptor is basically an integer an index to the file table to the process file table 
every index in that process file table re refers or has a reference to the file handle that is maintained by the kernel. And the file handle, basically what it maintains is it, it stores the offset of the file. So just like it should, through the file handle, you would know that from where you should start to read or from where you should start to write. And the file handle object has a reference to the file object. So the file object is basically the physical file on disk. And it is mapped, so as we can see here, file objects are mapped by the file system to blocks on disk. Okay. So, as a result, we have three levels of indirection. File descriptor through the file table points to a file handle. File handle points to a file object. File object points to the blocks on disk or the physical file on disk. Why do we have three levels of indirection? Because we need to enforce three different sharing policies. So the file descriptor and the file table are private to each process. The file handles also are private to each process, but if you fork, which means if you create another process, a child process, this file handle will be copied over. So it will be shared. Sorry, it will, it will not be copied. It will be shared between the parent process and the child process. But as long as you don't fork, the file handle is private to that process. The file object is shared system-wide. So if we have more than pro one process that is pointing to the same file, so they will be pointing to the same file object through the file handles. So file descriptor, as we said, in OS161 is an integer. And that is the index into the file table. File handle is a structure. And it's a process while file meta information. As we said, it could be private to that process. Or if that process fork and create a child process, then it will be shared between those two processes or more. And the file object is basically a V node. The V node is basically the physical file which is implemented and ready for you to use. And it is shared system wide. So now you might wonder, what is a vNode? A vNode basically is a representation of the physical file. It is defined in kernel include vNode.h, and it has a very useful operation that you might need to use for implementing your system calls like uh, VOP, read, VOP, write, VOP is seekable, which you will use with LC. And VOP is basically means the vNode operation. So if we go through the uh, vnode.h. This is the vnode structure. You don't need to go into the details. You can just read uh, the comments. And as you can see, we have a lot of operations uh, that is already implemented for you to use. But what you really need to care about is the read, vop read, and vop write. And also, uh, VOP is seekable. And these are implemented as macros. So you just, were, for example, VOP read if you pass the uh, vNode. And as you can see here, if you pass the vNode pointer and the UIO pointer that we'll talk about later, uh, it will handle the uh, reading the file. The same goes with writing, and the same goes with seekable. Uh, so the seekable, basically, it will tell you if the file is seekable or not. And there are a lot more uh, work that need to be done on your part. But the read and write, basically, it will all, uh, read and write for you. It will do everything for you. So this is the vNode. There is a la another layer that is built on top of vNode, which is called VFS, Virtual File System. And this is a more friendly uh, uh, layer that has a more friendly interface for you to use with other uh, system calls. So it provides a helper functions on vNode. 
and it is defined in vfs.h. And the useful function for you to use is just like open, close, change directory, and get the uh, current working directory. So let's go through the VFS. So as you can see here, the VFS has um, a lot of uh, functions that are already implemented and can be used. So what you care about is VFS open, VFS close, you have a VFS current directory, and VFS get current working directory, or change directory, sorry. So these are already implemented for you. You can use them uh, with your system calls. Uh, so this is vNode, and so as we said, the vNode is the physical file. You have very help, helpful uh, macros to use. VFS, the same thing. Uh, now, so you might wonder, OK, now, since all of this is already implemented for us, what should we really do? So your task is basically for this part of the assignment is to design the file table, design the file handle, and do most of the work for uh, argument checking. So the file table design, it's, it should be basic. So this is a data structure that maps the uh, file descriptor to the file handle. So since it is a data structure, you can use arrays, you can use a linked list, you can use trees. Depends on which one you're more comfortable with. But the most simple way to do it is using arrays. But you need to keep in mind that uh, so whatever data structure you use, it should be able to find the available uh, file descriptor whenever it is requested. For example, once you uh, call open, that data structure should be able to uh, locate uh, an available file descriptor. And while if you called read or write, it should be able to retrieve the file handle from that data structure. And also, it should be able to recycle the file descriptor. So if we close a file, that file descriptor should now become available for other uh, to use it to open another files. So this is all about the file table design that you need to know. Any questions? Now we go into the part of uh, file handle design. So the file handle design basically contains a reference, the major job of it is to have a reference to the file object, the vNode. And it has a lot of requirements. First of all, uh, you need to be able to tell uh, what is the offset on the file. So for example, if we have, uh, let's say, two processes using that file handle, uh, they should know at now if we issue a read command or a write command, at which point of the, of the file I'm going to start to read, or I'm going to start to write. This is one of the things that you need uh, to, uh, to store in the file handle, which is the offset. The other thing is it should check the privileges. So for example, if a process opens a file as a read only, so that process should not be able to write to the file. Or if it, if it did open the file as a write only, then it should not be able to read the file. So that means the file handle has to keep the open mood of the file and always check whether, uh, whether the service requested from the process is, are compatible with the mood that were passed uh, through the open Cisco. And it should be able to determine if it's safe to be destroyed. So at some point of time, you need to destroy the file handle. Since the file handle, as we said, so it could be private to the process, and it could be shared between processes if we uh, fork. So that means if we have two processes using the same file handle, and one of them call close, then that file handle should be able to know when it is safe to be destroyed or not. 
So how should you do this? You, you need to do this by tracking how many references to that file handle at the current point is. So if I have three processes uh, pointing to me, then if one of them call close, I should not destroy myself. I should wait because I still have two other processes that are pointing to me. Once that uh, counter reaches zero, it's safe to destroy the file handle. The other thing uh, to consider is uh, synchronization. So you have, so as we, ca as we said that the file handle is shared between several processes, could be shared between several processes. So if one of them tries to read, the other tries to write at the same time, you need to be able, the file handle should be, uh, should be able to handle such situations. So some people might uh, think, okay, so I think here I should use reader writer lock, but uh, this is not correct. Why? Because, so we have one file handle. It is shared between two processes. And both of them are trying, one trying to read, one trying to write. So whether each one of them, whether it's trying to read or trying to write, it's, it's going to change the offset in the file handle. And that means, basically, uh, they are writing to the file handle. It's true, for example, I'm reading, but I'm still writing to the file handle because I'm changing a value in that file handle. So that means the reader writer lock will not work with a file handle. A l basically, having a lock, a simple lock that we've, implement, um, we've implemented, will do the work. Because, so whenever a process tries to access the file handle, it should acquire the lock and then read, write, it will change the offset of the file. Once it's released the lock, the other process could access the file handle as a read or write. Is it clear? So using read or write or lock is not the solution for uh, handling the synchronization or concurrent accesses for the file handle. Any question on file handle design? Yes? Um, what about the actual file itself? Do you need to use reader writer locks for access to the file object? The file object, basically, no. So what happens in the file handle, you're going to use the VOP read, VOP write. And those should handle uh, everything for you. They will read and write. The third thing that you need to uh, do is argument checking. So you always need, as we said, you always need to use the copy in, copy out functions with user pointers to detect any kind of violation, like if the user pointer passes a null or unauthorized uh, memory location. So for example, uh, we, we will have a lot of pointers with these system calls that you need to implement, like in open you have the file name, and read and write, you have the user buffer. You also need to check if the file descriptor is valid. Whenever you receive an argument, a file descriptor, you need to check if that file descriptor is valid or not. You also need to check if you are allowed to read and write, as we said, the privileges. And this, for example, uh, has to be done through the flag that is sent and open. Let's say the open sends flags. Uh, that tells you the process needs access to that file as read-only or write-only or read-write-only. And the last thing also you need to consider is the error. Whenever an error occurs, you need to return uh, the error code. Where to know this, where to find this, you can find it into the manual or the man pages for the system code. Any questions? OK. Now we have the console. The console basically is a terminal. So this is here, where I, ty I type or I receive input or I receive output here. So the console is a special file. Why we call it special file? Because there is no concept of offset in the console. So basically, writing will basically append to the console file and write to the uh, print to the, on the screen. And the read will basically read the user input of the keyboard. So we don't have, for example, we can't say to the console, read the first 100 byte of the user input. There is no such a thing in the console. 
and that's what makes it special. Whatever the user prints and enter, it will get it. One other uh, thing that makes it special is that it has a fixed file descriptors. So the file table, the index 0, 1, and 2, these are reserved. The 0 is reserved for STDN, the 1 is reserved for standard output, and the 2, index 2, is uh, reserved for standard error. And the last thing that makes the console special is that you don't need to open it to use it. So it should be opened automatically for the user process. So for example, the user when he writes, uh, he or she writes uh, a program just like Hello World program, they won't need to open the console file to write to it. So they just print F and it should uh, print or scan F, it should get, it, get the input from the console. So that's what makes the uh, console a special file. So how should we initialize it? What you need to use to initialize or open the console uh, file is the virtual file system uh, function open, so vfs underscore open. And you should pass the name as cron semicolon, uh, uh, colon, so you should pass this as uh, the name and the flag based on what are you trying to open. Are you going to try to open the standard input? Then it should be read only. If it's standard output, it should be write only. If it's uh, standard error, then it should be write only. So based on the what are you trying to open, uh, you need to set the uh, flag for the VFS open. So you initialize it using the VFS open. So when should you initialize it? There are some stuff that you need to know. So the console file is only used with user, thread, or process. It's not used by the kernel. Kernel basically has the kprintf, and that will uh, handle the printing on screen for it. It doesn't need to open the console file. So the console file is, is only used with the user process or thread. And you don't need to open it with every process. So this is the common mistake that students make. Whenever they're trying to cre create a new user process, they try to open the console. And that will not work. What you need to do is you need to open it only once. And this is with the first user process created. And then later on, as you start forking, it should be copied into the uh, new process. So the console has to be opened only once with the first user thread or the first user process created. And the fork should handle copying, copying it to the new uh, file table. Any questions on the console? OK. So let's now, we will now go through uh, the system calls one by one. So the first one is uh, open syscall. So here are some points that you need to consider while you implement this uh, open syscall. First of all, argument checking, which is you need to check if the file name is valid since it's a pointer. And that's done using the copy in. You need to check if the flag is valid so it would be useful if we go. So he, this is the manual. So open. Now it tells you this is the name of the uh, syscall. And this is the signature. So it receives a file name and also receives flags. And there is a mood also. So now it describes to, you, for example, uh, the flags, what values they take. So this is a read only. And this is a write only, and this is a read write only, or read write, sorry. And you can also uh, specify if you want, for example, you want to append to the file. And if we go down, it will also tell you what you need to return, what does that syscall returns, and also the errors that you need to handle. So, for example, uh, if the file name is not valid, 
So you need to return the e-fault, which is file name was invalid pointer. So as you check uh, your argument, you need also to return the correct error code for, uh, for that argument if it's not valid. So as you can see, the manual tells you everything. If we go back, so the flag, we need also to check if the flag is valid. So as an example, what if the user sends this flag? This flag basically tells you, I want to open the file as a read-only and write-only. And that's not valid. And also in the manual, it tells you that these flags has to send to be sent alone. That means it either should be read-only, you, you should either send read-only or write-only or read-write. You cannot uh, just like combine both and send them as the flag for open. So the other question is, now you want to open a file. And as you can see that the open returns an int, which is the file descriptor. So one of the questions would be how uh, to find an available uh, file descriptor. And that's what we discussed, which should be based on your data structure. The last question is to consider is, uh, when you initialize a file handle, what should be the initial offset? So many of you would uh, might want to uh, know that or answer just like it should be 0. But you need to figure out, for example, what if the user opened the file and he wanted to append to the file. That means the initial offset has to be the end of file. And that's what you need to figure out, how to compute it. And as a hint, just go through the uh, vnode operations available to you or VFS. You should find one of these that will help you just get statistics of the file. And it will, for example, tell you what is the size of the file. And based on that, you can compute the offset or the initial offset. Close. So for close, So basically, close takes a file descriptor and should return uh, a zero on success. So what it needs to check is you need to check if the file descriptor is valid. And the other thing is uh, you should think how you should recycle the file descriptor. So once a file uh, closes, that file descriptor should be now available to be used with other files. And you also need to figure out when it is safe to destroy the file handle. And that's what we discussed with the file handle. So you need to check if uh, the file handle has only you are referencing to it, or if there are others referencing to, to it. So if it's only you, then uh, it's safe to destroy it. If it's not, then it's not safe. Now we have read, write. Let's go through them. So read receives a file descriptor. And this is the file that I want to read from. Receives a buffer address. And this is where I want to put the content or the data that I read from the file. And this is the buffer size. The same goes, or let's say the opposite. You're going to go with the write, which uh, it will receive a file descriptor to write to and a uh, buffer address that I'm going to read from and what is the size for what size I should uh, keep reading. So you need to check if the file descriptor is valid. You also need to check if the buffer pointer is valid. So since it's pointer, then you need to use the copy in. And can the user read write? So whenever the read write syscalls are issued, you need to check if the user of the pro or the process opened the file as a read only or write only or read write. And if that process is authorized to uh, execute that system call or not. Now, there is 
it's, uh, the read write is not as basic as you call VOP read and VOP write. It's true that they will do the reading and writing for you. But there are other stuff that you need uh, to consider, which is in order for you to use the VOP read and VOP write, you need to initialize a UIO struct. What is the UIO struct? So that is defined in UIO.h. So this is the UIO struct. So you need to first initialize that structure before you call a VOP read and VOP write. Because with VOP read and VOP write, you need uh, to pass the VNode pointer and the UIO into the, uh, the macros. So you need to get familiarized with what uh, is inside that structure and how you need to set these values. So the UIO or IO vector, the data block, this is basically the buffer. And the offset is uh, the amount of data I think you need to. This is the file handle offset. And the reset is basically how much should I read. And the sig flag is, should be one of these. So if it's a user code, then it should be user, uh, user I space. If it's a data, it should be user space. And if it's a kernel, so it should be sys space. So the uh, UIO RW, so this is, should be either read or write. So am I trying to read or write? And the UIO space, this is the address space, the process address space. So as an example, let's say I call read system call. The read system call, so has an FD, which is, as we said, an index for the file table to the file handle, and a buffer, and a, uh, how much should I uh, uh, read. So how would this fit here? So as we said, the IO vector, this is the buffer. And the offset, this is the file handle offset. And the reset is, this is the buffer length. Sig file, as we said, so it's going to be user space because it's a data. We're reading data. And RW read write, so since it's a read syscall, then this has to be set to UIO read. And UIO space, or the address space, so this is the address space of the structure, or sorry, of the process or the thread uh, calling that syscall. So once you initialize the UIO, at that point you are able to call the VOE read, uh, VOP read, and pass the VNode pointer and that UIO to it. And it will do the rest, uh, read for you. So this is basically telling VOE, uh, VOP read where you should read, uh, what you should read, and where you should store the data that you read. Any questions? The UIO is the one that many people get confused about or don't know how to, uh, how should they set it. LSEQ. So LSEQ basically what it will, it will do, it will basically just change the offset of the file, just change the location. Where I am in the file, I want to go to a new location in the file. So I will use the uh, LSEQ. I will pass a file descriptor position and once so uh, the uh, once has several values that you can use and it will tell you how you need to compute the new offset so what you should check is uh, one of the tricky parts of the LSEQ as you remember in the last uh, lecture we we've said that the LSEQ one of the arguments that it receives is a 64-bit so that mean since we have three uh, arguments received, one is 32-bit, that will be put into A0. 
A1 will be unused, the A1 register. The second uh, deposition uh, will be sent as a 64-bit. That means it will, you should put it into uh, A2, A1 and A2. And the once has to be on the uh, stack pointer plus 16. So how to get the once? You just get the pointer from the trap frame and add 16 to it. You should get the uh, once value. The other thing is checking. Uh, you need to check the file descriptor uh, if it's valid. And then you need to calculate the new offset. How you should do this, it's mentioned in the uh, manual. So it's here. Here how you should calculate it. You need to check, to check the once value, and it tells you what you need to do. Uh, change directory it's, it should be easy. So change directory, it will basically receive a path name. Since it's a pointer, you need to check if that pointer is valid or not. And uh, you can use the, uh, I think, VFS underscore change directory uh, method for it. Get current working directory the same. It will receive uh, a buffer and uh, a buffer length. So it works as an open, or sorry, as a read. It will read the file name and put that file name into the buffer. So since the buffer is a pointer, you need to check if it's valid or not. Now the last uh, syscall that you need to implement, which is a little bit tricky or people get confused about it, is dub2. So the manual tells you that dub2 clones the file handle, the old uh, file descriptor, onto the new file handle, the new file descriptor. So if the new file descriptor names are already open, then uh, you need to close that. So let me explain this. So you have the file table and the process diagram or figure that we have. So this is the file table. And the index of this uh, item of the file table is the FD, which is file descriptor. And it is pointing to a file handle. So you have an old FD and you have a new FD. Each one of them are pointing to a separate file handle. So the dub2 basically will take those both two FDs. And what it will do is let the new FD points to the uh, to the file handle that is pointed to from the old uh, FD. And this is what we mean by cloning. So we are cloning the file handle into the new FD. But you need to make sure that if the new FD is pointing to an open file, then you need to close that file first, and then you need to uh, let it point or clone that uh, the old FD file handle into the new FD. So this is what basically the dub2 syscall do. This is how it works. So what you need to check is to check if the file descriptors are valid or not. So as we can see here, that dub2 receives, the, it only receives two file descriptors, the old and new. And again, you have the errors that you need to handle. So for example, if the file uh, descriptor is not valid, you need to return that error code. Now let's take an example. Some people ask, so what is the usage of that DOP2 uh, uh, syscall? So everybody should be familiar with echo uh, Linux command. Basically, echo, whatever you give echo, whatever string you give it, it will just like print it for you again. So if I just like run echo hi, sorry. Sorry, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's spelling. Yeah, so it will just like print it for you. So this is what echo do. So if we pass hello world, it should print it for us. So let's assume that this is the minimal code for echo.c, which basically takes an argument and print it for you. And this is the uh, 
So this is your right side. The right side code, this is the minimal shell code, which basically fork a new process. And then if we are in the new process, which is the child process, I will call execv, which is execute the uh, echo command. Uh, else it will wait for the child to exit. So now what we want to do is, let's say I want to redirect that string from the echo instead of printing on the screen, I want to redirect it to be printed into a file hello.txt. How should we do this without changing the echo? So it's not feasible, for example, uh, for you if you want to do redirection to change the user code. So in order to do this, uh, we need a syscall something like uh, doc2, which basically will change the shell code and not the echo code. And it will be something like this. So we will fork and create a child process. And now in the child process, I will open the file hello.txt and uh, send the write-only uh, flag to it. And then the open, as we know, that it returns the file descriptor of that file. So I will take that file descriptor and run the dub2 on it. So the file descriptor is the old FD, and the standard output should be my new FD. So what it will do, it will clone the file handle pointed by FD into the uh, standard output FD. So whatever goes into the standard output will be redirected into that file. And then I, will, I can uh, uh, close FD. Uh, and here, if we run the exec v, which is run the echo command, basically it will redirect the uh, whatever string that you pass to it, it will redirect it into the file. So this is one of the usages of uh, dub2 command. Any questions? OK. So this is what we have for today. Uh, thanks for coming. And next week, we will uh, cover the processes calls. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Just a minute.